Go ahead and download all of them. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so, hello everyone, my name is Kyle Johnson. Uh, this is my second time being to a Blender conference, but first time presenting, so obviously super nervous, but I thank you all, everybody, for coming. Hopefully, um, I can walk you through a couple of different uh, cool projects that I've been working on recently um, on making maths real and maybe it get more tangible, and then the moon uh, tactile. And for my fellow Americans in the audience, sorry about the plural on maths right here. I've been living in the UK for the last uh, six years, uh, where we pluralize uh, maths as well as spellings and stuff like that. So, uh, so hopefully everybody uh, can, can kind of follow along with that. All right, <clears throat> so a little bit of background about me. I'm an engineer by training. I have about 20 years of doing um, kind of physics simulations and, and modeling and uh, computer science, uh, aerospace engineering types of things. Um, I'm here in the capacity as a 3D tinkerer, um, as a novice, as an amateur, um, kind of like in and amongst the, uh, you know, the um, high council of people that use Blender and all you artists that, um, and people that put together videos and stuff like that. So I feel like a little bit of a fish out of water, but um, hopefully I have something to add to your kind of experience with Blender and how we can make some things that, and some science topics really, uh, really resonate with people. Um, I'm passionate about education and specifically science literacy, um, raising uh, two young kids up in the top uh, picture up there uh, with my wife, and um, we're constantly trying to uh, have them understand literacy, understand uh, science, and, and just be curious about the world and be curious about asking questions. Um, I also, uh, in my downtime, enjoy uh, time with family, uh, reading, sailing, that's the picture in the bottom, um, and then more recently, AI tinkering, and I'll delve into that just a very little bit. Um, that's my URL, and again, if you go to there and then uh, BCon24, you can get the, the files. All right, so um, talking, this is, these are two very disjoint topics. Uh, the first one doesn't really relate to the second one, other than we're trying to take like complex mathematical and scientific concepts and making them so they're more immersive, more uh, visceral, more real, uh, more tangible. Um, but if you're trying to link the first half of this talk with the second half, um, you're not going to be able to do it other than uh, we're just trying to make complex topics more, more approachable. So the first bit is uh, making maths real. Um, what's the motivation behind this? Um, so I set out to, to model uh, quadric or quadratic surfaces. Um, you guys are familiar with these. These are um, shapes like a cone, shapes like a sphere, uh, stretched out spheres. Um, like um, oblate spheroids and ellipsoids, um, and then hyperboloids as well. So um, just these complex uh, uh, shapes that have a very definite mathematical structure. Um, why do I care, other than being a kind of a math and science nerd um, about these shapes? Um, they have applications across a wide range of scientific disciplines, uh, most notably 3D graphics, which I think hopefully everybody in this room can resonate with. We're constantly trying to understand what these quadric shapes look like and then intersections with um, how you do ray tracing or how you do um, intersections with these shapes. Um, and then also GPS location. So um, to actually get your GPS receiver to work, uh, it needs to figure out what the intersections of some of these complex shapes are um, and then intersection with the surface of the earth. So there, there are applications in a wide range of areas. Um, why would I want to do it in Blender? Uh, one, quadrics are kind of hard to visualize. Uh, so having a, just a 2D image is, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to understand the 3D representation of it. So getting these things into like the 3D sandbox that is Blender, you can rotate them around, you can adjust them, um, and then you can really kind of see how some of the parameters play out in the actual shape of the object. Um, and if uh, quadrics are hard to visualize, then intersections of quadrics are particularly hard to visualize. So that's the motivation for trying to do this uh, within Blender. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start with uh, uh, a hyperboloid, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a second. Um, this is uh, kind of a couple of years of approach, uh, technical approach, condensed down to one slide. The first thing I started with was uh, using a Python Blender add-on that um, I developed. Um, there's tons of examples online on how to do this. I'm fluent in Python. I can uh, program it um, at, at length, especially with uh, math and science topics. Um, there's tons of examples, but once you create an object using the add-on, like I create this, um, this hyperboloid right here with these two foci points, 
um, once I create that object and then kind of clear out that create new object menu, I can't move this thing around. I can't change the parameters. I can't adjust the curvature or adjust the foci or the anchor points. So that's kind of the big downside of the, uh, the Blender add-on. Um, and I'm sure that since I did this a couple years ago, things have come a long way and maybe we can do that now and adjust the parameters. Um, but that kind of shifted me, and that was really when geometry nodes started becoming popular. So that shifted me towards looking at geometry nodes. This has been a game changer for a lot of people in the room, I'm sure. Um, but then being able to um, have non-destructive creation of these uh, complex mathematical surfaces, you can move the foci points around, you can change the parameters of curvature, and I'll demonstrate all of this. Um, but then uh, complex node graphs can kind of become unwieldy. Um, and so I've tinkered around a little bit with uh, specific node groups and things like that, and I'm going to actually cheat and bring in a node group from one of those files so we don't have to go through all of the math. Um, but then we can inspect that and you guys can, you have the file so you can look at that offline and kind of see how we did it. Um, I'm currently working on custom geometry node. Uh, it's a work in progress to be able to do the complex mathematics as well as intersections and then also move around the foci points. Uh, it's super performant, written in C, any physics you want to bake into it, uh, you can do that. Uh, but then you have to recompile Blender and there's quite a bit of uh, like software development, heavy lifting that goes along with that. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to walk you guys through how to create a hyperboloid and we'll go through all of that. And then we'll shift to the, the 3D printed moon project. Um, so a hyperboloid, uh, this is the locus of all points, all points in 3D space where the difference in distance between two points, uh, F2 and F1 in the picture there, um, is a constant. So you pick any point in space. Um, and then you uh, figure out the distance to F2, figure out the distance to F1, subtract those values anywhere that that is a constant that you pick, that defines a hyperbola or a hyperboloid. Um, it's defined um, in X, Y, and Z space via that, uh, that uh, quadratic equation there. Um, so you can already see we're going to be doing a little bit of math, nothing too crazy, raising some powers, taking some square roots, uh, that type of thing. Um, what I want to do is create that 3D representation of that um, oriented between two foci points. Um, and so we're going to start with it along the Z direction. Um, I uh, pulled these pictures from uh, Wikipedia because I didn't have time to render them. This would have been super simple in Blender, uh, but did that um, uh, just a couple days ago. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take that hyperboloid equation um, and then we're going to define a couple of other parameters in relation to that. And then uh, that bottom equation is what we're going to get into Blender. Don't worry if that equation doesn't make sense or um, you're not really uh, tracking on that. Um, I'll make it a little bit more clear why we're using geometry nodes and how we're doing it uh, for that. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to Blender. And just so I can show you, we're starting with something brand new. Uh, so we have the default cube, and everybody, we always hit A and then X, delete everything. So that's how we're going to start. So we're going to start with uh, adding a mesh. Um, I always like to pick icospheres because they're super cool. Um, and this is going to be our first kind of foci point uh, that we're going to anchor our object to. So we're going to grab that and move that along the X-axis. And then we're just going to control D, or sorry, shift D and move that one along the x-axis again. So now we have two points. And if you think of this as point one and point two, we're going to create and gonna slowly build up that, uh, that parametric surface kind of in between them. So we need another, uh, we need another object. So we're going to create a geometry node. So we're going to shift A. And I'm going to add a plane. I'm going to get rid of this geometry and add my own. But I'm just going to start with a plane. You can start with whatever you want. You can start with the default cube. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to do that. Um, we're going to go into geometry nodes with this selected. And then <clears throat> we're going to slowly build up uh, kind of the idea of a hyperboloid and what we mean by that. So what I, what I want is when I move these focus points around, the hyperboloid is going to stay anchored to halfway in between those two points. Um, and then it's also going to be oriented. So I want to take this Z axis uh, of this plane and I want to orient it along the axis that's going between the two points. So to start that, we're going to add a new geometry node. Um, I told you I'm going to get rid of this. So we're going to or shift A. We're going to add a grid. 
And then this will allow us to, um, oops. Ah, scrolling a little bit weird, sorry about that. So this will allow us to um, have parametric control, simulation control of the size and also the number of vertices uh, within our grid. So we're just gonna tie uh, the size um, in, of X into both uh, size X and uh, size Y and then vertex X into vertex X and vertex Y. So it's gonna be square. It's gonna be the same number of vertices on each side. And then we'll just tie that into our uh, output or group output, and then we can adjust this. We can animate with that. We can um, kind of do a bunch of different things and change it since uh, geometry nodes is non-destructive. And then you can see that if we go into uh, kind of wireframe, you can adjust the number of points. Now that's going to be important because it's going to define like how high poly or low poly or how smooth our resultant hyperbola is. All right, so now how do we get this? Uh, right now, we don't have any knowledge of our foci points in here at all. I move these things around, nothing happens. How do we get uh, information from that into, uh, into our geometry nodes? So we're gonna start, just gonna drag this, uh, the first icosphere down here, and we're gonna drag the second one down. So this is getting object info from another outside object. And you can wire these to the kind of the input if you want. Um, so that you can change the objects kind of parametrically, but we're just gonna stick with uh, Icosphere and then Icosphere.001 for, for the time being. Um, now, uh, I think a couple of days ago, Ducky3D came out with a video on like the power of math in geometry nodes. I highly recommend it, fantastic watch. Um, the main thing that I took away from that is the importance of understanding what a vector is versus a scalar. Um, and then the, uh, the vector math that you can do within that node. So I'm gonna go over two operations uh, that hopefully will allow you to kind of move things around uh, in an intuitive way and align things. So if you have uh, two different positions um, and we just get the location uh, here from, object, uh, in, uh, from the first object and then the second object, and you add those uh, vectors together. So we're just gonna do a vector add. Tie it into there and we're gonna tie this one in here. And then we divide that vector by uh, two. So we're adding the vector and then dividing it by two. Can just add all those there. This is now gonna be a vector value out of this that is halfway in between the position of your two foci points. So we're gonna shift A to add a uh, transform geometry. Put that right in there. And then this is gonna come right into the uh, translation. So now we have, as we move that focus around, this plane, the origin of that plane, will always be transformed to the center, uh, the, the, the vector that's kind of halfway in between these two objects. I also said we want to align it because it's really hard to do math uh, when everything's rotated and everything's kind of adjusted. So we're gonna build up our math in uh, kind of everything aligned with X, Y, Z, and then we're going to adjust it and rotate it. So we also want to rotate this. And then that is, um, I'm going to quiz the audience. Does anybody know the vector math operation to find the vector from one point to another point? Uh, so I added them in one and divide by two, yeah? Yeah, you subtract them, exactly. So I take the same locations and I have a vector subtraction. And now this is defining a vector that points from one to the other. And I go through this mnemonic many, many times in my head over and over again, but it's the final minus the initial. So the vector that you're pointing to, uh, that goes into the first part. And then the uh, minus initial is uh, the initial point where that vector started from. So now I'm going to align this, align rotation to vector. So this is gonna output a rotation that is aligned with that vector from one focus to the next. And now I can just plug that right into my transform geometry. Oh. Subtract. Let's see, translation scale, 
This is the risk of a live demo. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So we're going to align. Thank you for that. Yeah, we're going to align the subtraction uh, uh, to so the, the, that vector to the rotation. And then we'll plug this back in here. Awesome. Thank you. I love audience participation, especially when it's that helpful. So now we can see we move this thing all around. And not only is it um, in the center, but it's also uh, kind of aligned where the z-axis of our original plane is uh, from one vector, or sorry, from one focus point to another. So now here is where I do a bit of cheating. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new collection just so we can keep all this stuff kind of separate and click on that collection. And then we're going to file append. So we're going to go into our... Uh, downloaded file, and we're going to use the Quadric Surfaces starter, and we're going to go in and we're going to append the, um, let's see, Hyperbola 1, 2. So this is going to bring in a bunch of other stuff, uh, and we can hide that collection. But the main thing that I wanted to bring in was if we go over and now select that collection, we have, should have, and let me know if this doesn't work, we have a hyperboloid node group in here. So what I want to do is just show you very briefly what that node tree looks like. So all of this is doing exactly what this equation did uh, down in the bottom right here, uh, bottom left, is we're going to take the x uh, component, the y component, and then we're going to um, put it through this equation, and then we're going to output uh, the Z, how much we need to displace that, that Z value by. So now we can go back into our original file, uh, into our original node group, and then, sorry, we're going to copy that. And then bring it back over here. Now, um, instead of using my grid here. There's a grid already baked into here. It's done the exact same way as, as I have the grid up here. So I'm just going to take the mesh size, plug it into my size X, the number of vertices, plug it into my vertices X. And then now uh, I'll talk about two different parameters. So the baseline, um, it's just a name that I came up with, is the distance between the two points. So to figure out the curvature of the, this parameter, um, that you need, you need to know how, how far it is between those two points. And that equates to the value D in the previous uh, slide. So I'm going to plug this in. And we have, we are, we've already figured out the subtract. So this is a vector that points from one to the other. If I take the length of this vector, I'm going to use that length. So now it was a vector value before that had an X, Y, Z component. Now it's just a length a scalar component. I'm going to plug that into baseline. And then I'm going to plug for now this delta distance over into uh, the group input. Now I can replace that geometry that we created before with this one. And not super interesting uh, for right now, but what we can do is this delta distance is, remember that, that parameter that I told you about, any, any, any point in space, the difference in the distance to F1 and F2 is going to be that delta distance. Um, that's that's the, the, the value D in the uh, previous equation. Now I can take this and adjust that delta distance and have that create that hyperboloid. Let's make this a bit bigger. Let's make it 20 meters. And then we can uh, take these vertices and kind of scale them up. Um, and in this way, now, instead of having a single object that I created with an add-on, and then now I'm stuck with that curvature, stuck with that kind of delta distance, you can scale it, and, and you can um, maybe adjust the Z value in a way that's going to reflect the curvature that you want, or you can build it up in geometry nodes, and now we're going to grab this and kind of move it wherever we want and be able to do all sorts of different things. 
Now, what, I, what happened there is if my baseline, the distance between them, is smaller than my delta distance, you can't have that. That's uh, not a, a, a physically realizable uh, hyperbola. It actually goes to kind of a half ellipse, which I find interesting and needs more investigation. But um, the, main, the main point is like we can, we can now have something that we can animate, we can move around, we can solidify. And I think that the, the node group that uh, you all downloaded has some of those types of things in it. We can make it a wire mesh and then we can, we can animate it. Um, the other cool thing, so if you're following along, let's uh, append another feature from that file. We're going to go in, and now we're going to append cone intersection 1, 2. Now what this is, this is not a hyperbola, but this is a, it's still a quadric, but it's two cones, and we're going to figure out how to intersect those um, and then show the real power of this and the real power of, of doing this in geometry nodes. So we're going to append those points. And I think, and we're going to move them all into collection two so we can turn them all off. And I think in the cone intersection, if you click on that one, it has the viewport um, display turned off. So we can turn that on. Um, and then we still have uh, the collection turned off. So bear with me real quick. We're just going to turn all of these things off. And then the cone intersection, if you go into the geometry nodes, um, Go to the end, and I'm not going to work through this in detail. You should have the node groups. You should have um, kind of all the math in there. We're using a cone mesh primitive, primitive um, and then we're just intersecting them. But the main thing I wanted to show is if we uh, come in here and we're going to this Boolean, instead of intersect, we're going to turn it to a union so we can kind of see what's going on. And then um, I had wired the, uh, the object info out to these other foci points. So let's X out of those, X out of those, and we're gonna tie it to our original icospheres. So we're gonna, we're gonna eye dropper that. We're gonna go up and our original focus point is gonna be there, and we're gonna do the next one there. And then, these are rather large, so let's make this not so big. Maybe even smaller. Uh, let's do 20. And then the solidified size, let's just make 0 0.1. Again, you can wire all of these things to the output of the node group, and it's fairly powerful. Um, so we're going to hide our original plane that we all worked through. And what we're going to do is we're going to add another point. So another icosphere. I'm just going to shift D to create a third icosphere. And then we're going to go in there and our cone intersection, we have this other target feature. I'm going to select that third icosphere. So now what this is doing is anywhere I drag this target value, it's going to lie on both of these cones. And now they're kind of far apart, so let's do this. Let's move this closer. Let's move this kind of target location, this intersection location. So I, we, we, we had gone in and we had changed the Boolean operation to uh, union. So this is showing both of, this, both of the cones. Um, and then what we want to do is find the intersection of these. Again, this would be like if you have two things that are parameterized by being a constant distance from a vector and you want to find all the intersection points of that, uh, you can come into cone intersection um, and then back in geometry nodes, you can change this mesh uh, Boolean and in back into intersection. And since we solidified it, now you have this uh, kind of complex 3D curve that is precisely defined by these intersection of these, these quadric parameters. Um, why would you want to do that? Uh, to create kind of, I think, cool videos about... Um, like what these things would look like if they were kind of flying through space and doing different things. So I'm going to leave my audio off. I'm fairly certain that the uh, rights are okay, but I'm going to, I'm going to show you this, this video um, while I uh, play this and catch my breath for a second. And again, uh, yeah, shout out to Andrew Price. Uh, 
from uh, Blender Guru for the awesome tutorial on how to make like a realistic looking Earth that made all these like space visualization stuff a lot more interesting. Um, so you can, you can uh, kind of adjust these parameters and have a slider again within geometry nodes, create multiple surfaces and multiple things that are parametrically defined by where that kind of this red cone and this blue cone uh, are intersecting. Um, and be able to have this like really rich uh, visualization and this really rich rendering. This application was more for like, hey, wouldn't it be cool? What would it look like uh, if we could do this type of thing? All right, it's much more dramatic with the audio, so uh, you can go check that out online. Um, but what we'll do is we will uh, transition to the second completely disjoint part of this. But before we do that, while this is playing, I'll go ahead and take questions. Does anybody have any questions on the first part of what we did? All right. Was, there, was anybody following along uh, live on the, on the laptops? Uh, yeah, but we got lost. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, like Jacob said before, hopefully this is all videoed and we can go back through and kind of, uh, kind of go through it and do a lot of the, you know, back, 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 15 seconds, 15 seconds, 15 seconds to kind of do this. All right, so let's do this. Let's transition over to the next part. Um, and this is, like I mentioned, uh, kind of a completely different uh, modeling uh, kind, of, kind of experiment. Um, and the main, the main motivation here was uh, my son and I were looking through his brand new telescope at the moon and there's like, all these dramatic features. You can see the picture that he took over there. Um, all these dramatic features and wouldn't it be cool to be able to like touch that and to be able to like build that mental model about what it looks like uh, from a, a 3D printing slash maybe even model it in Blender and move it around. Um, and then I had also simultaneously been making these 3D printed sculptures that had these magnetic sealed lids. That's in the bottom, the bottom picture. Um, and I had been thinking for a long time, like can I uh, do an entire sphere instead of just that sculpture with a magnetic lid. And then that kind of like coalesced with the moon idea and uh, how can we figure out how to like, you know, touch the 3D printed moon. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, the overall approach, um, this one is not as heavy of use or maybe not even at all of geometry nodes. Um, but I think it's a bit of a clever use of um, object modifiers as well as um, uh, some custom scripts. So the scripts that are on the, the website as well, you, know, you can download those and, and, and see how those work. Um, and then I have attempted some geometry nodes uh, stuff for like where to place the magnet uh, recesses and stuff like that. Again, that's still a work in progress. Uh, I'll reiterate, I'm, an, I'm a novice, I'm an amateur, I'm a, a hobbyist. Uh, so um, hopefully, hopefully can do that uh, in spare time going forward. Um, we'll back up to that. So we're gonna go into Blender again. This one you might be able to follow on a little bit better with, it. maybe it goes a little bit slower. We don't do any of the appending or anything like that. Uh, so again, file new general, don't save it unless you really want to. Uh, A, X, delete, because that's what we always do when we start Blender. Um, and now what I wanna do is I wanna model the 3D moon. Uh, I wanna um, have the actual displacement, not just rendered, but actually something I can take into an STL put into a 3D printer and actually get out that, uh, that 3D shape. Um, so the first thought that might occur is let's use a uh, UV sphere. Um, why would a UV sphere be good? Uh, the digital elevation model for the moon that's on there, uh, sourced from uh, NASA website, it's defined, you take the, the, the two-dimensional sphere of a, of a uh, two-dimensional map of a sphere, and how do you map that to a uh, square? So there's unwrapping points, and there's the North Pole and the South Pole, and all sorts of like GIS Mercator projection things that we have to adjust and have to deal with. Um, but a UV sphere, because it kind of roughly relates to latitude and longitude, might be a good place to start. Um, so let's bump up the geometry quite a bit on this. Uh, let's do 128 segments by 64 rings. Um, and then let's make this a little bit bigger because when we apply the displace modifier, um, it's just going to be really, really ratty and we're going to want to back it off. So let's make this 
like a radius of 20 meters. Um, let's back off a little bit. Um, so you can see that it's still not great geometry. If we want to actually play, do a displacement modifier, it really won't work with that kind of coarse uh, geometry. So we're going to come in into our uh, modifiers pane, and we're going to add um, a, uh, a subdivide surface. Sorry, subdivision surface. Uh, this is going to take a little bit um, to, to kind of do this, but we're going to bump up the viewport uh, to three and the render to three, and then we're just going to go ahead and apply that. Um, in the actual final product, I did this much higher, but obviously we don't all want to sit here and wait for this thing to render and wait for rotations and things like that. So now the next thing we want to do is uh, we're going to generate this, um, sorry, deform. Uh, modifier, and we're going to displace it by that digital elevation model that we have for the moon uh, in the, on the website. So we just come in here, and we're going to displace it by a new texture, come down to our texture editor, and we're going to open that file. Um, you can get much higher resolution values. I just put the, the 4K version on there because, again, we're dealing with... Uh, you know, a laptop and running where we're doing a live demo, so we want it to be somewhat performant. So we're going to open that image, and that's not at all what we want. So how do we how do we get it closer to what we want? First, let's come back and uh, let's change these coordinates. This isn't local coordinates. We want this in UV coordinates. Again, we're on a UV sphere, and then uh, obviously where our scales are off a little bit here. So let's uh, have our strength from uh, one down to like zero point one. Okay, that's a little bit better. Let's go a little bit smaller though, because that's still rather large. Um, and we don't, this is not really 3D printable with all these things hanging out. And it's also not representative of what the actual moon looks like. So we're gonna take our strength and go 0 0.03, let's say. A little bit better, let's do 0 0.01. All right, so this is, this is more manageable. Um, I'm going to leave it at that for now uh, to kind of illustrate a couple of points. Um, I came up and told Jacob the previous talk about color management that if I had seen his talk, it would have saved me a lot of time and a lot of 3D printing time because I had 3D printed a moon that looks just like this. But if you look at this, the real topography of the moon is not so boring on this side as to what this is showing. Um, I, I you know, took, took a look at this. This is actually what we're looking at here is the near side of the moon. And I just realized that our aspect ratio is off, so that's not doesn't look like a sphere, which is horrendous to me. So I apologize to all you guys. It looks like a sphere on mine, um, and maybe I can fix that. But um, there's something going on with the color, with the way we're mapping from our digital elevation model and mapping that to the displacement on the sphere. And it turns out that down here in our texture, uh, Jacob just talked about our color space and uh, what I need to have instead of sRGB and have like a lopsided uh, sphere is uh, what, what color space? Does anybody know? Non-color, non thank you. See, so if I would have come to BlenderCon last year, maybe I would have noticed that. Um, so now we get something that looks a lot more symmetrical. The near side of the sphere looks a lot better. Um, and now we can even bump this up a little bit uh, to make this a little bit more interesting. So we'll leave it right there. But now, uh, go to 3D print. I had printed out a bunch of the panels and I come to print the North Pole and it looks really, really ratty. And I mentioned before, when you have uh, a UV sphere um, and then everything is coming together kind of at the North Pole, uh, you have the what turns into really, really skinny, really, really long mesh uh, surfaces and faces, and that is trying to pick out a single digital elevation model from the UV uh, image. And it just makes for like a really wonky, really weird looking sphere. Um, so this is where I think it gets a little bit interesting. Um, so let's go back here and hide that for now. And what we really want is something that has kind of the same size shapes all over our sphere, whether on the North Pole, South Pole, somewhere near the equator. Um, so again, to keep heads from nodding, uh, what, what's another spherical shape I can use that kind of has that uniformity of face size? Icosphere, my favorite of all the spheres. So we come in here, we're going to add a icosphere. 
And then now we're going to bump this way up. Let's do eight divisions. And then let's make this another, let's do radius of 10. I forget if I did 10 or 20. Uh, but now in, if we go into edit mode and then we zoom way in, you can see that our each individual triangle is the same. So this is a top-down look, same, roughly the same size as this is an equator head-on look. So now this should be much better for um, kind of not stretching it out, not getting it all wonky up near the poles. All right, but there's another problem, and I'll show you that in a second. So what we can do, we can leave edit mode. We're going to come back in. We don't need to subdivide this at all. I think we'll just kind of keep the mesh uh, density that we have. We're going to add our modifier. We're going to deform it with a displacement modifier. And now we already created our moon texture. So we're just going to use that texture that we already imported. And then now this one, we still need to bump down the strength. Uh, we still need to change the coordinates to UV. Um, and then now that looks, that looks crappy again. What's, what's going on here? So the thing that's going on here, we have these like down near the equator. Again, it looks pretty good, except for a lot of our uh, craters are more oval, more elliptical looking. And they're especially elliptical looking on the, on the screen there. And then as we get up near the poles, um, we get these like really weird seams where it looks like you know, you kind of you cut up the moon and kind of stapled it together with these gores. So what do we get? What, what's the what's the cause of this? So I'm gonna pull a vertical split, and we're going to look at the UV editing and see what's going on. So we're gonna select all of this, and you can see hopefully straight away that where we wanted the, uh, the, the UVs of the triangles of the mesh to map all the way from 0 to 1 on the y-axis and all the way from 0 to 1 on uh, the x-axis, it's kind of this Charlie Brown looking uh, squiggle shirt down in the, in the bottom. I don't know. I'm sure there's a really, really good reason why those are the default UV parameters for an icosphere. I'm going to use this platform to lobby that we change it to what I'm going to turn it into. Um, but uh, this is the main reason why it kind of looks like those gores that are stitched together and oblong looking, uh, looking shapes. So we, we could, you know, I won't make you guys sit here and watch me do this, but we could scale these, scale it just in the Y direction, try to grab it, move it up here. But then we still have these gaps in here. I'm going to grab that, move that over there. Not, again, not going to make you guys sit through this. Uh, but that's, you're never, ever, ever going to get that many uh, mesh faces to have the correct UV spacing in order to do this. So what we're going to do is we are going to go to one of my three favorite all-time tools, and that is Python scripting. And uh, we are going to change this view to a text editor. And then here we want to open up, actually let's select all here again. Here we're going to want to open up the, um, the uvmapping.py file. So we're going to open that up. Um, I'm going to take a quick, quick second to talk about, uh, I talked about I'm dabbling a little bit with AI. I don't have any AI generated art. However, um, I think it was uh, ChatGPT wrote code from here all the way up. And it worked right out of the box. Now, I know that um, there's quite a bit of contention in AI-generated art, especially in a crowd like this. However, um, I would hope there's slightly less contention in using AI to make uh, novice programmers and developers way more productive, uh, and especially in engaging with BPy and the Python, uh, the Python uh, API. Um, so that's my quick plug for, for ChatGPT uh, and for doing automated code generation. It works pretty, pretty, pretty well. Um, the main thing that this is doing, and you can go through it uh, kind of at your own leisure, is we're going to iterate through all of these faces. We're going to grab uh, the UV of it, and we're also going to grab the vertical, or sorry, the vertice position. So for every single loop in our mesh, we're going to grab the what its current UV mapping is, and what the uh, or an object to the current UV mapping, and then we're going to grab the XYZ position of that. Because then what I can do is I can use, uh, again, a little bit of math down here, a little bit of uh, NumPy within Python, and I can calculate how far each vertice is 
away from uh, the center. I can uh, calculate where each vertice is uh, in the xy plane, and then I can calculate uh, latitude and longitude. I'm gonna comment out these real quick. Kind of some debugging stuff. So I can figure out the latitude and the longitude for each vertice in my moon. And that is the exact number that I need to map into my UV texture to get that, that digital elevation model. There's a bit of adjustment, so that's what I do right here is I calculate um, instead of from negative pi to pi for latitude and from, oh, sorry, negative pi over two to pi over two for latitude and from negative pi to pi for longitude, I have to scale it from zero to one in both uh, dimensions, but I can do that and I can set, since I have now, I can zoom in, there we go. Uh, now I have this UV object and I can set that equal to um, my uh, X value equal to the longitude and the latitude. So I'm going to run this and we should see, it's, it doesn't take too long to run, but we should see our Charlie Brown looking weirdness over here kind of convert to um, what we would expect a UV mapping to look like for an icosphere. So again, this platform, I lobby to make this the default mapping for an icosphere, but that's okay if not, because we have the power of Python and scripting and uh, a community under our belts to do this. Uh, the real, um, let's get rid of this. The real power of this is, does it look good? Let's go back to layout uh, and do, and it looks like we have a pretty good looking sphere. Uh, at least on my screen, the craters all look uh, circular. Um, and then um, we don't have the weird gores. We don't have the weird bunching up near the North Pole or the South Pole. And you can now take this into something that you want to 3D print. Um, I have about nine minutes left. So I'm going to kind of scream through the rest of this. Um, how do I, I, I don't want to just print, you know, something the size of my little hobby 3D printer. I want to print out something that's much, much bigger. Um, and then I mentioned that I have these magnetic adjustments, these magnetic attachments. So I want to have all, all these uh, panels that snap together really nicely uh, for the big sphere. Um, so the way to do that, I'm going to hide this real quick. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, so... I'm going to come in and I'm going to add again an icosphere. We're going to take the subdivisions down to one. We are going to add a modifier of um, bevel. It's in generate. We're going to bevel this. So this is now an icosahedron, a D20, if anybody's a tabletop gamer. And we're going to scale this down to a D12 or a dodecahedron um, because dodecahedrons are awesome. Everybody loves them. Um, and we're just going to apply that. Now, what I want to do, I have a dodecahedron. I want to create panels that intersect with this. Um, how do I do that? Uh, take this into um, edit mode. I'm going to uh, select all of the vertices. I want to do a um, merge by distance because that bevel probably created some redundant geometry in there. So just make sure that that's working. But I maintain my... Uh, maintain my, um, my uh, geometry, maintain my dodecahedron. And now I want to create independent objects that I can grab and uh, intersect with my, my, my moon sphere. But there's a problem. These are all kind of uh, not, they're all attached to each other. So what we're going to do, again, select all of our uh, faces, and we're going to do a um, split faces by edges. And then now I have a different geometry for all of these faces. Now what I can do is I can select all of them and I want to extrude them. So I have a positive geometry instead of just these individual faces. I'm going to extrude individual. I'm going to uh, do this around the, each of them being around um, the individual origin. And now I have a, uh, kind of individual geometry for each of these faces. While I still have all of them selected, I can scale this. And you don't have to get it perfect, but you can kind of get it close. And then what I want to do, now I have each one of these panels, extruded panels, 
is its own separate object, but it's its own separate kind of disconnected geometry because I, I split them all up. But now I want to uh, create the, my own individual uh, object so I can apply Boolean modifiers. So I'm gonna leave everything selected and I'm going to do a separate by loose parts and it'll break out the icosphere into now 12 icospheres that I have right here. And if I get out of edit mode and I select one of these, now this is like a geometry that I can do a Boolean intersection with uh, for uh, intersecting with my moon. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna stop there for now. I do plan on putting a much more lengthy descriptive, uh, like a full build out of this um, on online. Um, so I'll be sure to try to, try to link it on there. Um, the, the main steps that are left to do, which aren't terribly complicated, is do a Boolean intersection of uh, the moon with each of these faces. And then you can have like these, these panels and there's some magnet recess stuff that has to be done as well. So I apologize for running out of time. Um, I'm going to jump real quick to kind of the conclusion. And then the real reason that I wanted to talk about this, this topic, um, the, 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 the use of Blender as like a 3D sandbox, a 3D toy, uh, to kind of have all these different like real physics and real math baked into it with the kind of advent of geometry nodes and then simulation nodes at last BlenderCon, um, you can do like real physics um, and have it be um, maybe not super high fidelity, like super computer style physics, but it's super responsive. You can pan things around, you can look at them, you can adjust parameters and see how that affects your 3D shape. Uh, then you can also 3D print these things out and actually touch them. So. Um, at the end, I'm gonna invite people up, uh, hopefully in a couple of minutes that we have in between. Um, and we actually have the, the whole full 3D printed moon with the magnet recesses. If people wanna come up and kind of play around with it and touch it and, and actually see like what the, the 3D printed moon looks like and hopefully develop that, that kind of tangible mental model. So a couple minutes left. Are there any other uh, questions from anybody? How did we do following along with that one? Is it a little bit better? A little bit better, okay, awesome. All right, with that, uh, yeah, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it.